This episode of the Better Two podcast is brought to you by Kitty Mystic and DM Needham, author of the Better Two Burnout series, which includes her latest releases of Fairy Tales and I Love You and His Love Just Another High. Hi, and welcome to the Better Two podcast with DM Needham. I'm your host, Donna. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to Australian country singer Chloe Styler. Chloe has a term called Yeehaw Pop. That's what her music is categorized as. And it's a little bit like Lisa Loeb and Jewel to me, but I think you should check her out. And I think you should stick around and check out our podcast as well, because we talk about all sorts of things musically. You might have heard my voice hosting the Better Two podcast, but did you know I'm also the mastermind behind the Better to Burnout book series? The stories unravel the lives of Nigel Hardigan, the groovy bassist of Sambuca Fedora, the stunning singer-model Ava Richards, and the suave record executive singer Russell Langford. Love, romance, and drama run rampant as their lives tangle up. But brace yourself, folks, because not every tale has a happy ending. Snag your copy today from most online booksellers. Hi, Chloe. How are you doing today? I'm great, thank you. How are you? I am fantastic. So are you in Australia currently or are you in Nashville? I am in Australia. I was in Nashville not too long ago, but I recently flew home and have um, been settling back into Aussie life. Okay. So I take it that means that there's no concert dates coming up in the U.S. then? No, not at the moment, but I have uh, just booked another trip to come back. Um, I suppose I'm kind of splitting my time between the two places at the moment. So I will be back later this year for some writing and some uh, finalizing of some recording that I did in my latest trip. Because I knew that you had, you were over here working on some tracks and when are, and you're going to be releasing more singles as time progresses and I'm sure you have more singles that you're going to be releasing that's what you're going back to do is work on some more music yes absolutely so uh I was recently in Nashville in June and I recorded four songs so an EP and uh excuse my voice this whole episode as well I'm like fighting some kind of flu which it's winter in Australia so there's just all those yucky bugs going around but um in yeah in june i recorded an ep so we got my vocals done but we need to just finalize a few things before it comes out next year so i will be back later this year to finish that all off nice now you you actually had the a meeting with uh luke wooten back when you were 15 years old yeah so my producer luke wooten and i actually met uh, it was a bit more informal than a meeting, I suppose. Um, when I was 15, I visited Nashville uh, with my parents for the very first time. And my dad had a friend that lived in Nashville who knew Luke and just connected us um, just as basically as somebody to know in town while we were there for a couple of days that um, maybe grab dinner with him or something. And uh, yeah, the next thing I know, we're going to the, the studio at Station West on West Iris Drive in Berry Hill, and um, that's where I ended up recording 11 years later. So it's a really lovely full circle moment and experience for me, and I, I'm just so grateful to have um, to have Luke in my corner and on my team because he's just an incredible producer, and I feel very, very fortunate to bring my songs to life with him. And that had to be a pretty amazing, like you're saying, full circle, because when you have that moment where your position has changed, the dynamic of the relationship has changed, because being a 15 year old girl, you understood a little bit, a little bit of the past. No, when you step into that studio, did you not think anything? I mean... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I was 15, we recorded some covers and then they're still they're on like burnt onto a disc, a CD in my house. And um, I could pull them out if I really went looking for them. But um, I guess at that age, I, it was all just like a huge dream and like a, a, a bit more unattainable than I suppose it is now as I'm essentially like doing the thing and I'm I'm playing music in another country and I'm doing all those fun things that I could only truly dream about at 15. So yeah. Um, it's it's really cool to look back on um, on those times and and that first meeting with Luke, and I also think fifteen year old me would be <laughs> so just she would lose her mind if she <laughs> if she knew that like this was my third trip to Nashville in twelve months like just gone and uh, I'm working with Luke as a in a producer artist capacity and um, yeah it's just 
it's really cool. Life is cool sometimes. <laughs> so when did you discover that you could, you wanted to be a singer? I was pretty young when my parents put me into singing lessons. I was about seven. And then they put me into the choirs and the, the musical theater productions at my school. Um, and from that young age, I just loved it. And I loved being dramatic and singing and all of those things that go along with being creative. Um, and my parents were, I love them dearly and they really nurtured that in me and, and um, taught me that there's no such thing as can't. So if I want to be anything I want to be in the world, I can. So I obviously chose a very difficult career <laughs> and a very um, popular career choice for a lot of people. And it's, it's a hard one to break through, but when I, you know, when I left high school, I did actually go to college and I studied uh, a Bachelor of Business Management and a Bachelor of Journalism, but my heart was always pulling me back to, to music. And so I recorded an EP uh, when I was 20 and that was like the first, the first taste of actually doing music as a, as a career or as a, more than just a hobby. Um, and I just loved it. And then I, you know, I immersed myself in the Australian country music industry and I did what we call the Tamworth Academy of Country Music here, which is just like a couple of weeks where you learn about songwriting and industry connections and networking and, and like live stage presence and performance t tips and tricks and things that I had never, ever considered. And so I suppose it was like my early 20s where I was like, okay, this is definitely what I want to do. But it was something that I've known since I was seven when I first started singing that I've always loved it. Well, and when you were talking about going to college, taking a business management course is one of the best things you could do because you don't want somebody else to, dare I say, have access to everything that you do and make your decisions for you. And while it's nice to just sit there and say, okay, I'm a singer and I don't have to do this, you want you want to be able to know what people are talking about. Definitely. And I'm very grateful for those few years at college and having the business management degree. I majored in marketing. So that does come in handy when I'm doing all my cover arts and my music videos. And I do it all myself. I'm self-managed and independent. And uh, I make all the decisions, which can be overwhelming at times. But I do think having that business degree that I can um, draw upon and also the journalism degree comes in handy as well for for interviews and um, for, you know, I can read it and write up a press release if I need. And my bio, I, I've never had to get anybody else to write a bio. Like I just kind of do it all myself, um, which saves money in the long run, but also adds stress onto my plate because I probably could just delegate that, but I'm, I'm a control freak. So <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> but, but I mean, the, the fact is, it's kind of like, did you set yourself up when you were thinking about college? Okay, if I take the business course, and I take the journalism course, then this is going to actually help me with the singing, because then I can market myself. And then I can I can manage myself. And I don't have to pay these other people. I think the really smart answer would be, yeah, I knew what I was doing. But <laughs> I, I did so. not. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I graduated high school and my school was very academic and it was kind of um, a sense of, okay, well, this is where you go next. You go to college or university. And uh, that's what I did. I went to college for five years and I actually started out in a music degree. I was studying creative industries and majoring in music, but I didn't really feel like I needed to study it to do it. So I, that's when then that thought process came in and I was like, okay, well, if I don't need to study music, what can I study to help with my music? And that's where the business management. Um, and then the journalism was just really rogue. And it was cause I just really like, I really like English and um, linguistics and those kinds of things. So I just really enjoyed that kind of, I really enjoyed those studies, but I definitely don't use them. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's something to fall back on that if you, like you said, when you're doing an interview, you can handle yourself in an interview. There's not going to be this moment of, well, what do I say now? You can know yeah. something to say, even if it's just something polite or trite or whatever, you know how yeah. to pull it off. Yeah. And I suppose with journalism as well, uh, you know, that's looking for a story and writing, writing a story or a piece on somebody or something. And that comes in handy when I'm writing a song, because sometimes I'm drawing upon other people's stories and, and, um, and lived experiences that I might not have experienced yet. Uh, and at least I kind of have the, the tools inside here somewhere buried back there somewhere of, of how to really draw upon 
people's stories and experiences and, and draw it out of them and, and write a song. So I want to go back to the 15 year old girl. When I think about, you know, I'm looking at you with the two showcases, the CMA Fest, two sound Australia showcases in Nashville, including your debut in the Bluebird Cafe. I mean, there's yeah. people that are still longing to do that, that have have been producing music and putting music out for a while, but they still have not been able to do that. So what was it like? It was amazing. It was so pinch me. I just remember walking in. It was it was my second time in there as like forever. I because I'd only been in once before to see my friend Phil Barton play um, on a trip earlier that year. It was last year that this happened, and uh, I walked in and it was still like all shiny and new, and I was just overwhelmed by the fact that I was in the Bluebird. And then they were like, "Okay, time to get on stage," and then that was overwhelming. Um, but it was overwhelming in like the best sense. I was nervous, but I really channeled that into excitement and just trying to soak it all up because it's so cool and there's so much history in those walls and the crowd are phenomenal. The people that go and watch a Bluebird Cafe performance know how to be an audience and they sit and they listen and they respect your stories and uh, they really, really, I suppose, let you have your moment. And I really felt like we all had our moment. There were four of us on stage and we all got a moment uh, in that round to 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 show who we really are and, and also soak it all up because it might not happen again. Who knows? Um, but at least I can say I've done it and it was it was incredible. Well, and it's such an intimate venue. Yeah, I mean, it was like 60 people there or something. It, it's quite intimate. And those are rooms that I'm used to playing back home in Australia. When I put shows on, I perform to, to those size rooms because in my my area we don't have uh, an we have really large venues or we have really small venues. There's not a lot of in between size venues. So I'm used to the intimate kind of size. So it was quite nice to be at the Bluebird where I was like, oh, I played to this like a month ago <laughs> at home, but it's just entirely different and on an under, complete other scale. <laughs> I can imagine. And and so like when you opened up for Tony Hadley from Spandau and Tom Bailey from the Thompson Twins, was this an arena show or was this another small venue? They were theatres. Okay. So uh, the Tony Hadley tour was back in 2020 and I did five dates with him around the country. We performed at, yeah, theatres. So in my state it was the Tivoli Theatre, in New South Wales it was the Enmore Theatre and so on and so on. And they were rooms of about um, between 1,200 and 2,200, which was amazing. And they were pretty big rooms for me at the time. I was very, very, very nervous for those shows. But by the time Tom Bailey, Thompson Twins Tour came around two years later, um, they were very similar size rooms. There were even a couple of overlaps of the same venues. And I felt a lot more confident. I'd also just grown up a little bit. Like I was yeah. two years older and I'd had a lot more experience under my belt. So I wasn't as um, nervous for, I mean, I was still nervous. Don't ever get me wrong. I still get nervous, but, um, I kind of knew what I was walking into, but I suppose with the Tony Hadley shows, like I didn't know what I was walking out on, like into right. and what the audience was going to be like. So, um, I do love a theater. I love performing on theater stages. Maybe that's a musical theater nerd in me coming out. Um, cause I'm used to that from being a kid in all the productions at school, but, uh, I do love a theater and the history behind those. Well, that's the one thing about theater is like you said, there is such history. There's a theater in New Orleans where I grew up called the Sanger. And when the lights go down and the, ha the house lights go down, they painted the, the ceiling to have stars on it. So you see little oh. starlight. It's beautiful. And yeah, beautiful. I mean, they redid the theater from when I was a kid. So, cause it was shuttered for a long time, but to, to see a theater be brought back to life and in its prime once again is a, it's an amazing thing. And there, like you said, there's such history in them. Yeah. It's beautiful. And as the performer on stage, I, I love it. I, I, I mean, I haven't played arenas, so I can't say I prefer it over arenas, but it's nice to look at it and see the history as well. Like with, there's a theatre in Brisbane, not far from me called the princess theatre. And it's recently been, uh, renovated and brought back to its historical beauty and standing on that stage looking out you can see the like the historical architecture and stuff from stage so it's really beautiful 
Well, and that's the one thing when you look at, when you're talking about you've not played arenas, you still, even in a theater show, you still have an intimacy with it. It's not the bluebird, yeah. but there's still, no, it's not the bluebird. <laughs> but there's still that intimacy because you can still see most of your audience. You're not totally looking out and just seeing this whole chasm of people that, you know, a sea of people that, you know, that's going to be a little overwhelming. Yeah, I could only imagine. I've played big crowds at festivals. So I played a festival a few years ago called Big Red Bash and there was about 7,000 people there and that is overwhelming. So imagining that in a arena <laughs> with in an enclosed space, that's just a lot I'm imagining would be um, a lot on the brain to take in. Oh, yeah. I mean, nobody really thinks about when you go out on stage that, you have to, you have to turn yourself, you have to flip a switch. You have to put yourself in overdrive because if you don't, your performance is not going to have that oomph that's going to connect with people. I don't care. Yeah. And, and I know you know that. And no matter how bad your day is, you still have to perform. Yeah, definitely. And there's been times that I've had to do that. And I suppose the bigger stages you get onto and like the um, further along in your career you get those days probably a more often than not because you're touring so much um, but sometimes it is hard to get up on stage when you've had a bad day and really give it your all but the way I look at it is it's there's people out there that deserve a great show and you got to give it to them no matter how you're feeling on the inside so um, I just try and do my best. That's all you can do. That's yeah. all you can do. I mean, there was a, when I first started doing the podcast, I had booked an interview that I really wanted to do on the date of my uh, husband's passing, the first anniversary. Mm. And I, I did it per partially because it's like, I need the distraction. But when I was on camera, you can't tell. You see no. smiling, laughing. It's a great time. And I got off camera and I cried. And so it's yeah. like, I think as, as perf you know, because in a way you have to perform even doing this. So, so it's like, as a performer, you have to put on that mask, which comes back to your theater background, to do what you need to do to show people a good time so they can be entertained. And it takes a lot of courage and strength, and especially to get up in front of a live audience. This is intimate. This is not a big deal. But getting up in front of 1,500 people, that's a bigger deal. <laughs> a lot bigger. Yeah. And if I overthink it too much, I let it get in my head and I, I really... I think I kind of tank the performance, but um, if I just remember why I'm doing it, because I love writing songs and then I love playing those songs to people and, and connecting with people through those songs. And I just love being, I love being on stage and singing them. Like, it's just so much fun to me. And if I remember that, I think I do okay. But if I get all up in my head about it and I'm like, psyching myself out well where's the fun gone like why am I doing that it's still got to be fun you know right. so that's something I'm trying to do more of uh these days than previous <laughs> years and performances <laughs> what what's the best show that you've ever played do you think in your mind I mean out of all the, the venues you've played all the shows you've played what is your favorite show do you mean my my best performance yeah. as a performer Me no, meaning your if you could go back in time to the one place you could play again to that moment. What would yeah. that be? Oh, it sounds, it's probably so cliche, but CMA Fest, that was, that was amazing. And it was a dream come true. And I remember saying to my dad, my dad flew over to Nashville with me um, last year for CMA Fest because I'd only ever been when I was 15 and I hadn't been back. And, um, yes, I was in my mid twenties. I probably could have gone by myself, but I was really nervous. And and right. and also, I wanted my family with me, and my mum couldn't come, so dad came with me. And I just the day before I I did the CMA Fest performance, I just remember saying to my dad, you know, if nothing else happens in this career, like I'm happy because all I've ever dreamt about doing is performing in Nashville, and I got to do that with CMA Fest, and. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I will never take that for granted and I will never forget that experience. And um, if the day comes that I'm playing a stadium show, that's so cool. But like, I just, that right. is, that is just the most amazing experience for me, getting an opportunity to perform in another country and sing my songs in another country, it, halfway across the, the world. Like that's just, 
that's just crazy. So if I could relive that again, I would. Well, and you have quite the reputation. I mean, you've had success in your homeland, correct? Yeah, I suppose. And that is those little building blocks over the last few years of having the success here is definitely what got me to where I was performing in Nashville and um, having that opportunity. So it's it's cool to see that growth over the years um, as a performer and as an artist and a writer and and getting the recognition as well. That's really nice as as independent and self managed because it's it can be lonely and I definitely cry to my parents about it a lot more than I probably need to. But um, it's yeah, it's moments like performing at CMA Fest or getting my Bluebird Cafe debut. Um, even like in my latest trip, I got to perform. Uh, and make my debut at the Listening Room Cafe in Nashville, which to me was a really big achievement because I've seen so many writers' rounds there and artists that I really admire performing their songs or or songs they've written um, for other people at that venue. And that was a huge bucket list moment for me as well as as an artist trying to do the Nashville thing as well. So um, there's just really cool things happening at the moment. And and I think I've just long-winded answered your question that well, I would fine. probably just relive everything. <laughs> I would do everything again. <laughs> well, that's the thing, you know, when somebody poses a question like that, you're like, okay, I got the moment in my head, but wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah. But wait, but, all of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And even the bad ones, like even the performances where I feel like I didn't do my best or, uh, you know, a, a show that might not have been the best, opportunity for me I would still relive them because they all still got me to hear exactly so yeah and that, that's the thing we sometimes lose track of even the worst things in our life led us to where we are and gave us the knowledge yeah. of who we are so I want to talk a little bit about your music um I when I was listening to your tracks you reminded me a little of Jewel and Le- Lisa Loeb which I know ah. doesn't necessarily fit into the country dynamic but the it, Jewel it, is bang on I used to listen to so much Jewel growing up well, then it fits. And, yeah. you know, when we're looking, I was listening to, uh, I believe, 25 and, it, you know, talking about faith right now, all will work out in the insecurity. So where does, you know, honestly, do you have a lot of insecurities or do you just kind of, do you ever fear, do you ever have imposter syndrome? Oh, that's an interesting topic because I didn't really know what it was and I didn't really think I had it. And then as I've gotten um, a little bit more, Success. I, I don't like that word either because I feel like it's all just relative to where you are in your career and and, and the, what you've achieved so far. But as I've c- gotten further along with what I'm doing and released more songs and had cool opportunities come my way, um, I, I've just had a few people be like, oh, wow, you're doing so well and blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm like, am I? Like, I don't even, I don't even realize that if three years ago me knew what we were doing now, like, that person wouldn't believe it. So I suppose I think I have a little bit of imposter syndrome in that sense where like, yeah, I, I, I got to play CMA Fest and make my Bluebird Cafe debut and it, it, but it doesn't feel like, it feels like I, I've done it, but it almost doesn't feel like I've done it. If that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It's really hard. So I have actually felt that in the last year or so, um, just with like lovely friends being like, well, you are doing really well. And it's like, am I actually, because I cry a lot and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm achieving what I want to achieve, but everything does happen when it's meant to happen and happens for a reason, blah, blah, blah. So, um, yeah, I think, that hopefully answers your question a little bit, but in regards to insecurities, yeah, all the time. Like I am always second guessing what I'm doing, always wondering if I'm making the right choices with what song comes out next or what I'm wearing in a music video or what the cover art looks like. Like I drive myself <laughs> to the level of insanity that is unreasonable, like it's so unreasonable for, for just a cover artwork. It's just <laughs> ridiculous but I'll do it and I'll do it to make sure that I can live with myself when the song comes out. Um, So those insecurities creep in all the time, like the self doubt comparison always creeps in whenever I see someone doing really cool things and achieving amazing things over here in Australia. I'm like, why is that not me? Or why have I not had that opportunity yet? Um, And then that's when the whole trusting in the process comes in. So with 25, it was, it was a, a big ordeal of just learning to trust in whatever you trust in and letting it do its thing and and knowing that something's got your back and everything will work out when when it's meant to and how it's meant to but it is so easy to fall into the trap of of being like oh but 
but what about me or why is it not happening for me? And yeah, and just doing that cycle. But I'm a lot more better, a lot more better. That's terrible English. Journalism degree not coming in handy there. I'm a lot better than I was um, when I wrote 25 and I'm learning to just let go of things that are bad for me and accept and, and appreciate what's good and what I have at the moment. I think, you know, the comparison thing, I'm an author too. So the comparison thing is a major thing that I get because you you sit there and you go, well, my book's good. Why isn't anybody, you know, what can I do? I don't want to spam the world with my book, but what do I do? And so then you start having doubts and you start saying, well, do I want to give up? Because there's how many other people doing the same thing that I'm doing. Yeah, that's huge. Especially when I visit Nashville, because (laughs) it's just so obvious how many people are trying to do it um, and, and wanting to achieve the same things as each other so that you can either get uh, like paralyzed with overwhelming thoughts of I'm never going to be good enough or you just use it as an opportunity to be like, well, how cool, how cool that we all have the same dream and we're all so talented and we can all write great songs and um, and just trust that if it's meant for you, it will happen. It's so philosophical and kind of silly at times. But if I don't think like that, I'm just like, it's a mess up here in my brain. <laughs> I understand. I mean, and for me, it's like, okay, as long as I'm writing and I'm enjoying what I write, that's all that really matters, isn't it? I mean, yeah, sure. I want yeah. other people to read it or you want other people to hear you sing. But the, at the end of the day, if you're getting satisfaction from what you're doing and creating as a creator... And that really matters. It's not the likes. It's not the clicks. It's not the reviews. It's what fills your heart. Exactly. And I'm at that place now where I'm making music because I love it. And I'm releasing it because I want to. And I'm releasing when I want to and and what I want to. And it feels great because I feel like I'm filling my cup and hopefully that's translating through to the audience and people that are finding my music because I've re- I really feel like me now in my music and I really feel like I'm just having fun with it now. And and that's what it should be. It should be fun and I should be doing it because I want to get the, the songs out and I want to write these songs, blah, 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 and and not trying to do it for external validation. That's where it would be that's where the tipping point would push you over into, uh, are you doing this for the right reason? You know? Well, and then there's the other avenue of people not realizing that whether you're an author or a singer or whatever, that this is actually a business. You have to treat yeah. it like a business. And that's, yes, the easy part is singing the song, laying down those tracks <laughs> or writing the book. It's the, every, everything else that comes with it. That's the work. Yeah. And it's a lot of work, <laughs> <laughs> always a lot of work, but, um, you know, I, I do have great publicists and my sister takes my photos and films my music videos for me these days. And I have a great graphic designer. Uh, I, so I'm, you know, I'm building a, a lovely team around me and I will continue to do so, so that I start taking some load off of my own brain. But until then, I will just keep at it, you know? Mm-hmm. So read a room. It was based on being ghosted. It was, unfortunately, I got ghosted last year. (laughs) So I, um, if you don't, do you know what ghosting is? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay, great. Because some people don't, but um, basically I was loosely seeing this guy last year and I can admit it was very new, but I also just think that common decency and respect is something that most people should have. Um. Yeah, we'd been on a few dates and then I flew to Nashville and I performed at CMA Fest and I could tell I'd been, I was being ghosted. And the one thing I kept telling all my friends was, oh my goodness, this guy is so lucky that I know how to read a room and I can tell that he's not into me so he can get away with not sending the text because I'm, I have self-awareness and I'm, I can tell, you know? Uh, And then I went into my writing session with Lauren McClam and Phil Barton. It was actually my first ever Nashville co-write and I word vomited as I do and I'm friends with Phil prior to this session. So I was just like really getting at it and getting angry as well. And Lauren, bless her heart, was just sitting there with the guitar and about 45 minutes later, she goes, okay, so um, what about this? And then she just starts singing what is now the first verse. And I was like, oh my God, like that's my whole 
word vomit in concise sentences turned into a song. It was amazing. So I really, really love this song. I'm really proud of it. I think it's really, really cool that we were able to turn something that was quite, it was quite hard. Like I don't, it's not fun to be ghosted. Mm. It, it's just like, just send the text, just send the text, say, Hey, not interested. Nice to know you have a great life. <laughs> <laughs> literally anything yeah but here's the thing people don't do that anymore i mean even because i sell stuff on facebook marketplace as i'm decluttering my home and they're like okay i'm gonna come get it on such and such okay and then and they I've don't got, show up no and i've gotten to the point it's like well where we're we gonna meet when you text me with that you're on your way then i'll give you the information otherwise i'm not wasting my time exactly yeah it's it's sleeping into every aspect of life these days. People just don't feel like they have to give an explanation. And then especially in dating, people just think that they can, they can just stop talking to you. Like they just died. (laughs) Just don't understand the, I don't understand the thought process. Like I've had a couple of uh, instances where I could have ghosted somebody, but I didn't because I respected them and, and their feelings. And although I didn't see anything with them in the future, I was like, you know what? This was a nice person. We went on a nice date. I'm just going to say really nice to get to know you. I'm not looking for anything. And that's the truth. You don't have to lie. Oh, anyway, um, can you tell it's still bothering me? (laughs) I mean, I get it. It's those things. And the thing is you don't, you know, before it was ghosting, I had dated a coworker once and he was giving me, you know, he seemed like a nice guy and everything else. And lo and behold, I found out later he was married. Good. And it's like, That's what you want. <laughs> I didn't realize. I mean, so it's like you, you don't, but he kept, it was, it was really, when I look back, it was really obvious because it was like on the weekend, he would, he would say, we're going to get together and go out somewhere for dinner. And of course, something always came up. Something always came up. His wife. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I mean, that's the it, so we had ghosting back then, even though it wasn't necessarily ghosting. Yeah. So yeah, things. I think I was talking to somebody earlier about the fact that how society has changed and the the, the respect and the normalcy that we had with certain certain rules of how to act, certain decorum. We don't have that anymore. No, it's it's quite. Uh, The word stressful, I say it a lot. So it's probably not stressful. Concerning, probably concerning a little bit. I'm still single. I'm, you know, in my mid-20s. And one day I do hope to have marriage and kids. That's just something that I want. And I'm like, am I ever gonna (laughs) am I ever gonna meet somebody that actually respects, you know, my time, me as a human being? Um and I don't know. It's it, and it's not just me being dramatic and think, thinking and feeling those things. It's it's happening to all of my friends at the moment, um, and it's a bit. It's just a bit weird. We just don't know what's what's next because this can only go on for so long. And it, yeah, I don't know. I don't. It, it, it's really interesting. And then even having people listen to the song and message me about it afterwards and be like, "Oh my goodness, this is happening to me right now," or "This happened to me recently." What is going on? I don't know. I think we need to start a support group or something for for b- people being ghosted. <laughs> well, and, and see, for me, I okay. So I last time I really dated was two thousand four because uh-huh. I married my husband. He's been dead four years now. I have not gone back into the dating pool because I'm like, yeah, we we have we have the the apps. We have the ghosting on the phone. I'm like, is it worth it? Is it really no. worth it? No, I can tell you, honestly, it's too much. It's I'm not on the apps. I don't do any of that. I'm just hoping that I'll meet someone naturally and organically. <laughs> Wish me luck. Hopefully we catch up again in a year and I have a better story for you. <laughs> I, I hope so. Now, I will say there was a guest, the the, air, the episode never aired on this podcast um, because there were sound issues and I, I wasn't going to air it anyway. The first thing he says to me, he was an older gentleman. The first thing he says to me is, you have lovely skin. Oh, and I'm just kind. thinking it's it's kind, but in the same token, this is the first thing you're saying to me when you see me, and all I can think is this is tad creepy, just a tad a little. creepy, because yeah. it reminds me of Silence of the Lambs or something. You know, it's just yeah, I wasn't gonna say that, but yeah, <laughs> it's just a little creepy. But I can understand why it never got aired. 
He didn't say it on camera. No, later on in camera, he's talking about let's go get some absinthe in New Orleans. And I'm just like, no, thank you. No. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just like, even here, you get some kind, sometimes you're just like, mm-mm, thanks, mm. but mm-mm. Mm-mm. so maybe no, I ghosted thanks. him because I was just like, ah, we're not airing this. So, no, nah, I don't think you did. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're fine. So what is your next single that you're going to release? Uh, I have actually a song called Call It coming out pretty much just as this drops. And uh, it's about uh, the lyrics are very, uh, just a big sigh because the lyrics are very specific. And um, it's just, it's about knowing that something can't be anything more than what it was uh, and calling it for what it was, which was just a really lovely time together for like a really small little period of, of a holiday in Tennessee and, um, and just calling it and accepting that it was that and not trying to make it anything else. So that's what the song's about. I've not had to explain that yet. So that's why I was like trying to figure out the, <laughs> trying to figure out how to word that without absolutely, uh, giving all my secrets away. But, um, I'm really, I really love this song and it kind of just fell out of me after my my trip to Nashville last year and I felt like it was a nice song to to put out because it really um it's like a four minute long song it's it's not for radio it's not to be the next number one hit you know it's just to to invite people into my life and also I know there's so many people that have little holiday flings and and meet people that they might think could be something else but you know it's never it's not meant for that. It's just meant to be something really beautiful and, and short lived and accepting that it's, that it's that. So I think it's just like a really nice, a nice little song um, that I can't wait to have out. And I'm, I, I'm a bit nervous if you can't tell that I, it's just like very specific to my life, but um, I think it's, I think it'll be good. There's a music video for it as well. So nice. I'm excited about that. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, here's the thing that, you know, not every song, as you said, is is going to go on the radio. Not every song is meant to go on the radio. And sometimes, especially for your fans, they want the deeper cut. They want the song that is more personal. They don't necessarily want the the thing that's going to be top 40. They yeah, want well, they're going to get it with this one. They're going to get the deep cut, the real inside my brain kind of one, um, which is where the nerves creep in. But I'm also like, you know what? I'm a songwriter and I exaggerate so many things for, for the song, you know, it's always based on true experiences, but there's a little exaggeration in there. It's fine. Like we all do it. Um, and <laughs> this one is no different. So <laughs> I'm, I'm really, I'm really excited to have it out. Um, I think it fits nicely in the world with reader room. It was produced by Luke Wooten as well. And um, it will lead into then my next single release, which will be coming out in early October. Okay. Well, what's, yeah. you know, when you're talking about exaggeration though, Social media, that is all it is. Everybody yeah. exaggerates their life. Nobody is living in turmoil. Everybody's got the glamorous life. It's like, yeah, crazy, right? That we just kind of accept that as is, but it's just so unrealistic. And um, I mean, we're all guilty of it. I'm I'm guilty of it. I don't post when I'm having a bad day. I probably should. I just don't post. So anyone listening that goes like, why hasn't Chloe posted for a few days? probably going through it, probably feeling emotions that I just can't be bothered dealing with um, on social media. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a very interesting time we're in. There's ghosting, there's, there's social media highlight reels that just kind of show the good, never the bad. Um, yeah. And I don't know, it's, it's kind of interesting to observe it all. Well, back to the conversation I had earlier, we were talking about the fact <laughs> that people are kind of obsessed with death and whether it be in books or murder podcast or i mean i have a friend who listens to murder podcast all the time she listens to him before bed and granted i'm guilty of watching csi reruns um crime you know i I watch that but i don't i I, i'm not obsessed with you know once i finish re-watching this i'll be done and but yeah there there's an obsessed cult now kind of about death and yeah and not in a good way it's like the murderer and it's like well it, why are we continually perpetuating this? Are you giving people ideas? Are we desensitizing everybody? You know? Yeah. I actually used to be, I used to be one of those people that listened to the true crime murder podcasts 
religiously all the time. And I started feeling very anxious all the time and very paranoid and on edge. And I couldn't, could not understand why, silly, I wonder (laughs) why. And then I would tell my therapist about it and she'd be like, what are you listening to? Like, blah, blah, blah. And I'd say, oh, I listen to this new podcast. It's so good. It's about this guy that killed all these people. And she'd be like, (laughs) you got to stop. So I, she told me to stop and I stopped and I don't listen to them anymore. And my life is a lot more peaceful. That's for sure. I do watch the occasional true crime documentary. I do find it interesting, yeah. but I don't like I used to, every time I got in the car, I would put a true crime podcast on. Why? <laughs> put nothing something like happy sun- on. <laughs> nothing like sunshine and rainbows with that. <laughs> yeah. And then feeling anxious all day. Why would you put yourself in that mindset? But I can understand the appeal. It is interesting. Yeah, it is. To- but in small doses. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's it's interesting to see how their mind works and, and things of that nature. But it's a little frightening because, number one, you're creating that anxiety level in everybody because everybody's going to see somebody as being the potential killer. Uh, yeah. And number two, you're you're now programming your mind to focus on this stuff. Yeah. Definitely. And, you know, when I travel, sometimes I travel solo. uh, And then because of all my history of listening to true crime, everything is heightened. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I should never have listened to all that because everything is, everything that runs through my brain when I'm traveling. And if I am alone, you don't want to be living up there. (laughs) (laughs) There's a lot going on. I can imagine like, you know, you're looking at somebody, oh, he looks shady. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so I mean and and the thing is it's bleeding into fiction as well because there's a lot of books that are coming out that are based more with with darker tones to it and people are okay with that I mean also you can you could almost say with songs as well uh there's that Lainey Wilson and Hardy song Wade in the Truck Mm -hmm. which is about have you heard that song Mm -mm. it's about uh, the Hardy character, like the male character, finds the Lainey Wilson female character on the side of the road um, and she's been beaten and he doesn't even have to ask and he knows it's a domestic violence situation and then he goes and kills the guy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, like, that's a – that I think that went – that would have gone number one and it, it's a great song, fantastic song. But, yeah, it, it, it it's a, a violent song. So uh, I, I suppose that kind of death, um, murder is seeping into songs as well. But it's kind of funny because, and I mean, over here, we've we've been called out on it several times that violence is very much in our culture, but yet sexuality, no, we can't talk about that. Which yeah. that's more natural, but over here, mm, no. Mm-mm. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought about that. We've, we've gotten called out many a times in the United States about that, especially because yeah, of the wow. gun culture. Yeah, I'll have to look into it. I and don't know. I can't. It's kind of funny because I know the history of Australia where where you guys are originally from. So it's kind of amusing that you guys don't have that reputation like we do. But yet, allegedly, you were formed on a penal colony. No offense. Oh, yeah. But, you know, the, <laughs> yeah. you look at this and it's like, well, what about us now? We, we are just a little bit outlandish over here at times. But anyway, we're not going to oh. go there. <laughs> So as far as the next group of songs you're releasing, are you putting on a different EP again, or are you going to put out a whole record? So this year's songs are just singles and they will just stay as singles. Um, But next year I will be releasing the EP that I've just recorded with Luke uh, in Nashville. And that will, I don't know when that will be out. It's just so fresh, but it will be out next year and there'll be four or five tracks. And um, yeah, we're very, very excited about it. I, I really love, really love the songs we've just recorded. I wrote them all by myself, which is, I'm really proud of that because a lot of my songs lately have been co-written, uh, which is kind of new for me because all my early stuff was just written by myself. But uh, I've been leaning into the co-writing a lot more lately, but these new ones that are coming out next year are all by myself, which is something to be proud of because I just wrote them in this room that I'm sitting in and uh, got my feelings out and now they're fully fledged songs. So now that we're talking about your room, you have two guitars and a keyboard. So I take it you play all of these things. 
I do. Yeah. So that guitar there, it was $70 from my local music store. I bought it um, when I got home from Nashville last year uh, because I was very inspired and I love the sound of a nylon string guitar and I didn't have one and purchasing it actually made a world of difference. And I wrote all these different songs on it that I don't think I would have written on my normal steel string guitar. Uh, and then that guitar uh, there is an electric and it's pink. And I, um, I haven't actually ever used it live, but I ride on it quite a bit. And then I have my keys behind me, which um, I'm actually fully trained on the piano. And I did all the grades and all the music theory and stuff, but I never actually perform with the piano, but I do write on the piano quite a bit. And it's a lot easier to have a keyboard. I have neighbors uh, that probably don't want to hear a piano at 11 p.m. at night going through the wall that we share. So <laughs> I'm sure. Um, yeah, I do play. I do play. And I play acoustic when I'm performing. When did you learn how to play keyboard or piano? My parents put me into lessons when I was six. So I played, I had a lesson once a week, every week from six to 17. And I did all eight grades of piano um, exams and uh, just, I mean, it's not as rigid anymore and regimented. I don't um, sit down and play scales <laughs> like I used to have to do, but I, you know, I find myself sometimes just wanting to play the piano for fun. And um, I'm very fortunate and very grateful that my parents put me into piano lessons. I think it's such an incredible instrument and you can do so much with it. And it's just beautiful as well. And the history of it, oh, yeah. I don't know, I'm a history buff. I'd never studied history, but I just think the history of the piano is really cool. And of course, with the guitar, with any instrument, and if you learn it and you get the opportunity to, um, to be able to play it, I think it's pretty cool. Do you plan on touring anymore? Touring? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to get my music out there. I'd love to tour. Um, I, it's such an interesting topic at the moment because I'm looking at moving to Nashville. So, um, touring might put, be put on hold a little bit while I um, try and figure out what I'm doing with my life. Uh, but I definitely can, I can play shows acoustically by myself and I can do support acts like that. Um, but I do love performing with my band. That's just something that I might not be able to, to facilitate while I'm, while I'm in the midst of like visas and things like that. Cause there's a lot of money that goes into mm -hmm. that to be so frank. Um, but I mean, any, anything that comes up, I'm going to say yes to. I'm, I'm in my yes era and I'm doing anything that comes my way and just um, taking life by the horns. Is that the same? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> grabbing, the bull, grabbing the bull by the horns. There we go. That's the saying. Um, so, yeah, hopefully some more things pop up and I can keep cheering. All the support acts I've had this year um, over the last six months, I've literally had like less than two weeks notice for for those tours that I did and they were like travel around Australia kind of tours. So who knows, maybe in two weeks time, I'll have something that I don't even know about right now. <laughs> Possibly. I mean, that's one thing I, when you, you brought up the financial aspect of it, you being such the small artist with doing all the self-management, the financial aspect of the touring and relocating that all falls on you. And yes, that is time consuming. It's money. It's, and as you said, visas, that's a whole, all that red tape to go through is a big yeah. portion for you. Yeah. And I just think it's, it, I think it's important to be candid about it as well, because, you know, when I've, I've started bringing up the conversation with my friends and my family and, and hoping to relocate if I can, um, some people go like, oh, wow, that's amazing. I'm like, yeah, but yeah, but there's a lot that goes into it. And, um, I'm probably gonna be eating chicken noodle soup for like the next year and tuna and rice and not spending my money on anything else. Um, if I do go with ahead with the visa process, cause it's, it's not, it's not the cheapest thing, but I love, I love America and Nashville. And I think I kind of owe it to my 15 year old self to follow through with that dream and, and give it a real go if I, um, if I can. So I'll, I'll do that. I'll give it a go. <laughs> so is your band based in Australia then? Yeah, my band is here and I actually went to school with my drummer and then um, we reconnected a few years ago when I started playing live uh, uh, in a band capacity and then we just kind of found the other players and they're all local to my area and I love them to bits. They're just really great and I 
I, I feel very lucky to have them in my band because they're just great guys and incredible musicians. And um, we do actually have a couple of shows over the next few months just around our city. And um, yeah, it's really, it's really fun to play with them. So do you think any of them would lo- relocate with you? Oh, no, I wouldn't even ask them that. They'd be like, what are you talking about, Chloe? We've got a life here. So, um, no, they've got, they're in, like, my drummer and my guitarist are in their own band called The Vultures. And um, then I, my uh, bass player is a session guy and he's a producer and he has his own things going on. So, um, no, absolutely, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even expect it of them. But I think they'd come visit for sure. They'd be like, show us Nashville. <laughs> And I'm sure you wouldn't have a problem finding a band in Nashville. No, something in my, something tells me that I think I'd be okay with that. I think there would maybe be some musicians there. Maybe. <laughs> just some, just a maybe. slight chance. <laughs> slight yeah. chance. So what would be your dream gig to play? Ooh, uh, the Opry. That's what I figured, but, you know. Yeah, that's just, like, hands down. That's all the – well, the Opry and the Ryman uh, are huge, huge dreams. So – one day, hopefully, we can we can catch up again, and I can tell you I'm making my debut. Um, yeah, just the thought of that is so cool. I've done the tour with my family of the Opry, and then I did the self guided Ryman tour by myself last year. And when you're at the Opry, you can choose to walk in the circle, mm-hmm. and I've not done that. I've not stepped in the circle. I'm like, no, I don't want to jinx myself. <laughs> so yeah. we'll see. <laughs> As a singer, I can see why you wouldn't want to do that. Did you did you ever watch the show Nashville? Yes, I did. I think that that is um, to be expected of someone like me, probably um, an Australian that doesn't like. I think I don't know. I don't know if Americans or people that lived in Nashville watch Nashville, but I mean, I definitely did, and I, I loved it. it. And okay, great, it's such a good show. <laughs> it, it is. Was just, and then I rewatched it last year when I came home from my trip in June. And I think I sent myself into a depression because I finally like knew Nashville mm-hmm. and I knew, I actually recognized a lot of the places as well. And I was like, wait, I went there and I did this and that and that and that. And then I was like, oh, and now I'm back home on the Gold Coast and I'm 9,000 miles away from from here, but that's a real place. And I've um, got a taste of it now. So you kind of like get the bug and you want to keep going back. It's it's not good. <laughs> so did, did the show do Nashville justice? Ooh, I feel I'm not qualified to answer that question, but um, I, I loved the show and it was cool to be able to, when I was in Nashville, be like, oh, like that's that and that's that. And, but I'm not, I can't, I'm not qualified. I, Fair <laughs> enough. Fair I don't want to step on anyone's toes. Fair enough. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to add? I don't think so. I think we've had a really lovely chat and I'm, yeah, I'm just really grateful for your time and hopefully we can catch up again one day and um, have some, maybe I'll have some exciting, exciting news to share. Maybe my EP will be out. Who knows? Who knows? And I would love to have you back. That'd be great. So thank thank you. you. Hey, Donna from the Better Two Podcast here. If you've listened to my show, you know that it always sounds great. That's thanks to the guys at 30 Year Audio Productions. 30 Year Audio helps podcasters, broadcasters, musicians, and business owners get their important messages out to their audience. Rich and the 30 Year Audio team are easy to work with. They're efficient and understand that your message is important to you. With quick turnaround and the true caring of your needs, 30 Year Audio is your go-to for any audio message. Reach out to 30 Year Audio at 312-388-5596. Rich and his team will deliver for you. That's 312-388-5596. Or you could email them at info at 30 or visit them on the web at www.30yearaudio.com. Chloe, I think she's got a bright future. Uh, I wonder, you know, we were talking a little bit about off air about moving to Nashville and Hopefully that move goes well. And if not, if she decides to stay in Australia, that doesn't mean she can go back to Nashville and perform and actually do touring over there. So I look forward to seeing where her journey is going to take her, because, I mean, I can imagine, you know, she's been doing this since she was six, seven years old singing and this, she discovered this is her passion and to be 15 years old and to meet this producer 
And now to be working with this producer and have your, him do your EP, it's a full circle journey. And I've had my own full circle journeys. And when you hit that moment where it may have taken several years to get to, when you finally hit that moment where you're, you're able to go full circle on something. For me, it was um, giving my book to somebody. When I wrote it, that was the only thing that mattered after I was finished is I wanted to give it to this person so they could read it. And I got to achieve that. Do I know if they like it? No. And that's okay. But the whole fact is I did what I set out to do. And I think a lot of that comes from us believing so wholeheartedly that we can do that. You know, when I look back, she was talking about trusting the process and things falling into place. And when I look back at my life, I've been very fortunate to have things fall into place. It doesn't mean I didn't work for it, but certain things fell in, you know, like winning the pizza, because we've talked about this on the air before, winning the pizza and then becoming a dish jockey. It wasn't something that was like, okay, I won the pizza here. And then next week I was on the radio. No, it took me going into the radio station and Todd showing me how to do things, how to program, how to pick songs. And yes, he sat there and said, oh, I just, I don't feel like programming anymore. So here you go. You do it. And granted, that doesn't happen nowadays. As far as programming, the station is pretty much programmed itself, you know, by the computer. It's all taken care of by whoever's programming the computer. But at the time, I had to put in that work to get to be, to do what I needed to do to become a disc jockey. And I think that's when we kind of lose track on things. Yeah, she got to she she had that 15-year-old dream of being a country singer. But there's been a lot of work to get to where she is. You know, she's in her 20s now and last year she played CMA Fest. That's a lot that's a quite a bit of time that she had to put in the work. She had to practice, she had to write songs, she had to build an image. So, when you look at things, everything, whether it be a chair in your house, Think about all the moving pieces that come in there. Your phone, think about all the pieces that are there. Not everything is simple. And I think we have learned so much that we look at the aftermath. Success happens, yay. We don't look at the work that is put into it. We don't look at what the creative has done to show you how to create that song we don't see all the work that went into writing those lyrics and putting all the music together we don't see what goes into making that television show sure if we watch the 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 documentary sure we can see that sure the clips behind the scenes yeah but that one hour show or maybe not even one hour in some cases it's 15 minutes you're not seeing the months that went into it or years Because sometimes, especially like production for a movie or writing a book, it's going to take a lot longer than that. And so you have to really appreciate all the work that goes into it. And while I brought up the murder podcast, I understand it's it's a thing that everybody's listening to. I get that. But I also have to step back sometimes and ask, how does it affect your life? And I mean, Chloe was talking about the fact that It was raising anxiety for her. And I don't think anybody thinks about that. You know, why is my heart racing? Well, but I drank a pot of coffee. I don't drink coffee, but you know, there's, there's a lot of times this goes back to looking past just the instant part. You know, there's a lot of times that if we actually sat down and really looked at the bigger picture, we would see why maybe we're anxious. We would see why we're worried and fear is a big thing, especially with your success. You know, the artist that creates things, we get fearful. We, we, what if you don't, you don't like it and you have to say it's okay. So don't get caught up in the anxiety of fear, because that's the one thing about that podcast that we were, we're talking about. If you're watching that constantly and you're desensitizing yourself, and then you start to see the boogeyman in every place you look, because this guy was a normal guy. And all of a sudden he went psycho. You're never going to look at people the same way. You're never going to trust them enough. And you're going to start worrying is this next guy or this next woman that pulls up next to me in a car, is she going to go off the rails? So 
if you're feeling anxious and you're listening to this, think about that for a second and see what happens. There's certain games I can't play on my phone because it makes me anxious. But I realize that and I stop. So how did I get off on this diatribe? It's because we were talking about the murder podcast. And like I said, I watch CSI. Hmm. Granted, it's reruns, but I still watch it. And I know if I need to, I can stop at any time. So be a little bit more aware of what you're what you're consuming at times. And if it feels like it's not right for you, whether it be food or whatever, do yourself a favor and take care of you. So on that note, I'd like to thank Chloe for being on the podcast. I'd like to thank Rich Zai from 30 Year Audio for doing the audio as well. And Fast Susie for the music. And most importantly, I'd like to thank you for tuning into the podcast. You're listening Well, that's part of the reason why I do it. Not to mention, I get to talk to some really cool people. But on that note, I wish you, whenever you're listening to it, whether it be morning, noon, evening, night, the weekend, whenever, I appreciate you and thank you for tuning in. And I'll catch you next time, guys. Bye.